Collins Fan Club has now entered the building. Good evening. Is it not? Come on. Has he got the dog? Thank you for your applause. There's still nothing I like more than a warm hand upon my entrance. <laughs> That's the sort of level I work on, I'm afraid, for the majority of the time. I'm strangely drawn to this punter here. <laughs> Even at this early stage of the game. Is this your jacket here? It's your denim jacket. In fact, you're a symphony in denim this evening. What's your name? David. David. It's all warm, this. It's been on your lap, I suppose. What do we think of this? What about this empty seat here? Is no one sitting here? Is there some amusing anecdote attached to someone who was going to sit there? Would you mind if he put his jacket there? Is that all right with you? What was your name? David, I knew it was something nondescript. <laughs> That's much, much more comfortable. Would you like to put your jacket over there as well? <laughs> Although they might get confused, mightn't they? <laughs> Two peas in a pod, look. An apple cleft in twain. That's a bit of Shakespeare, hello. How old are you? <laughs> 21, really. Tell surprise. <laughs> He's a big boy, isn't he? <laughs> don't get many of those to the pound. Um, don't clap on your own, please. <laughs> Someone will throw you a fish. <laughs> what was this thrown on stage? Fish fingers. <laughs> From 7-Eleven. 149, the captain's table. How lovely. Um, one of my hobbies, apart from eating fish fingers thrown at me by deranged punters, is mountaineering. I don't know, I know it's an unusual hobby. I don't know how I came to be interested in mountaineering. Um, I think I was a very impressionable child. And when Julie Andrews sang Climb Every Mountain, I took her literally. <laughs> I was halfway up that mountain with a haversack on my back. I think it was a haversack anyway. <laughs> the thing is, you, you want somewhere to keep your billy can, don't you? You want a cup of tea when you get to the top of the mountain. I know I do. I did consider carrying a cup up with me from the bottom. But of, of course, that's pointless. By the time you reach the top of the mountain, half of it would be in the saucer. <laughs> so that's no use to anyone. I love that moment, though. I love that moment when you reach the tip of the mountain and the team leader whips his flagpole out. That's if you get that far, of course. I mean, sometimes the mist will descend and you're left there just groping in the dark. Groping in the dark. Just a normal day, really. For me. What's, what's that punter there doing, mincing in at this late hour? I'm afraid you've missed my spectacular opening. If you'll pardon the expression. 
I'm sorry about this upstairs. I'll be with you in a moment. But <laughs> this is a bit of an outrage, and I don't think we should let it pass us by. What's your name? Any idea? <laughs> Um, it's gone. It's gone? Yes. Rather like your hair, I suppose. <laughs> Haven't got much hair, have you? With a lovely head of skin. <laughs> you don't mind me saying so. Oh, huge this stage, isn't it? Huge. Biggest direction I've ever worked on. Now, there I was one day on the mountain, if you recall, groping in the dark. I heard this disembodied voice. It was the team leader. He said, we're looking for base camp, Clary. I said, well, I found that years ago. So. It's a little known fact, but in 1981, I was the first man to mince up the Matterhorn. <laughs> a year later, I tackled the difficult north face of the Eiger in slingbacks. <laughs> Nowadays, I wear these Dr. Martin boots. Can you see, David? <laughs> I used to wear stiletto heels and slingbacks. Uh, I thought about it. I, I thought, well, that's a bit effeminate, really. <laughs> No, I think it is. I went to dinner recently with Lord Longford. Um, it, oh, it's a terrible cough, isn't it? Do you hear that up there? You want to suck a fisherman's friend? <laughs> if you take my tip. Um, Lord Longford, yes, I, w I was sitting in the restaurant and it wasn't my idea, the, the whole, whole evening's enterprise wasn't my idea. It was some wacky journalist's idea of an interesting combination of people. And in walked Lord Longford, and so I said, good evening, Lord Longford. And he said, good evening, Julian. And he breathed on me. <laughs> it wasn't pleasant. <laughs> and then, well, he's got terrible halitosis. Let's uh, <laughs> spell it out quite clearly. Breath like a cat, that man's got. <laughs> But I thought, it's not his fault, he can't help it. Um, I'll just breathe through my mouth all evening. <laughs> Which isn't, was well, not easy when you're trying to eat. Um, I had to take very small mouthfuls for the whole evening. Which isn't in my nature at all. <laughs> I tend to wolf my food down. And then he sat there and he started dribbling all over the table. I thought, well, that's not his fault either. Um, so I just slipped surreptitiously down to ground level, and I slipped a packet of Rothmans under the table leg, um, so all the dribble went in his direction. <laughs> Apparently his trousers were soaking wet by the end of the evening, but that's another story entirely. <laughs> um, I sat there, I sat there eating my avocado pear, and before I'd had, <laughs> for my starter, you know, and before I'd had about three mouthfuls, he'd managed to upset me. Um, he started going on about gay people and how he thought of gay people much the same way as he thought of bald people. <laughs> he said, it, people struggling through life with a difficult handicap. I was a bit offended, aren't you, on behalf of bald people? I thought, you're, you're offending a whole, a whole stream of minority groups here in one swoop of green steam from your mouth. <laughs> and so I, I put my fork down, very decisively. Down. Because <laughs> you don't need a fork with an avocado pear, do you? <laughs> and I picked my spoon up. And I waved it at him. Menacingly. I said, you can say what you like about gay people, Lord Longford, but generally speaking, they don't have bad breath and they don't dribble. <laughs> uh, 
Well, that shut him up. Um, he sat there hogging the condiments all evening. And <laughs> sulking. I had to ask him three times to pass me the salt. I think he was hoping I'd get cramp. <laughs> it's no good. It's no good in... All right up there? Not a dry seat in the house. Um, it's no good inventing a radio microphone, is it, without a radio microphone stand? Because I, I can wonder where I want with this, but I have to come back here to base camp if I want to have a rest, you know. But you, you want something that will just follow you around 18 inches behind, I think. <laughs> that would be ideal. <laughs> did you ever see Trick or Treat, David? Yes, that was a show I did. Yes. How very discerning of you not to applaud. <laughs> they all applauded in Derby. <laughs> I thought, now we know where we stand. <laughs> um, well, Trick or Treat apparently was family viewing. <laughs> I'm not quite sure what family viewing is. I've been touring up and down the, the motorways and... Well, no, I've been touring the motorways. What am I talking about? <laughs> what nonsense. I've been touring up and down the country, shall we say, and, and via the motorways. Um, no, I thought of a joke there, but I've dismissed it. <laughs> in an instant. Um, I've seen families, that's the point I'm trying to say, at the service stations, you see families um, there carloads of sticky children and irate adults, as far as I can make out. <laughs> but this show isn't family viewing, that's the point I want to make. This is lonely bachelor and single parent viewing. <laughs> Mind you, everyone's welcome. You can't be too picky with halls this size, I don't see. <laughs> Any old riffraff will do. Just aren't enough supply teachers to go round. <laughs> Your jacket's enjoying itself, David. <laughs> Made friends with the other one. They're intertwined there. Who does your hair for you, David? <laughs> Is it the council? <laughs> now, I rarely go anywhere alone these days because I don't like to, and um, you've already seen my pianist and constant companion, the lovely Russell. He's now called the oh-so-lovely Russell. That's something I notice when you introduce Russell to people. They go, oh. <laughs> um, we'll wheel him on now, but I, I do want you to bear in mind while you're watching Russell this evening that he is, in fact, the only known heterosexual in the world of show business today. <laughs> Apart from Judith Chalmers. So... Would you welcome, please, the lovely Russell Cherney. <laughs> Hello, Russell. Hello, Julian. You are a heterosexual, aren't you? I am, yes. I can't emphasize that too much. <laughs> and is it a lonely life for you, being the only known... <laughs> The only known heterosexual apart from Judith Chalmers? Or do you and Judith Chalmers manage to steal the odd <laughs> evening together? No, we've never met. Never no. Never. No. Probably just as well, isn't it? <laughs> Who knows what chemistry there might be between you. Indeed. Mm -hmm. Russell doesn't only play the piano for me, uh, he also does all my housework, <laughs> which is a boon. The first thing I see every morning is the lovely Russell having a squirt and a wipe in the living room. <laughs> Good, lovely eyes, though. Lovely eyes. Can you all see Russell's eyes? Look, look up there and show them your eyes, Russell. Sort of goat's eyes, I like to think. <laughs> He'll make someone a lovely yogurt one day. <laughs> when he's a bit older, perhaps. And you've got a girlfriend, haven't you? I have. Yeah. As if to prove a point. <laughs> the lovely Helga. But um, you and I have been together a while now, haven't we? Professionally speaking, yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. 
Two years. Is it two years? It is. Good Lord. Man and boy. There's a kind of umbilical cord running between us. You could hang your washing out on that cord. You could say that, yeah. Indeed, I just did. <laughs> what were you, Russell? Can you remember that far back? Before I plucked you from obscurity? What, what were you then? I was a nobody. I just wanted to make that point, really. <laughs> have, you got, have you got the rhythm of life with you, lovely Russell? Yes, I've got it right here, yes. Right, right. We'd never have known, would we? <laughs> you hide it very well. Because I think it's important to stretch yourself um, as a performer, and I've been stretching myself in a musical direction. And I think we'll do a song is what I'm building up to. I don't need all this nonsense. I could just get on with it, you really. Could, you I? could, really. I'm shilly-shallying, yeah, Russell. You are. You are a heterosexual, I aren't am. you? Yes. <laughs> There's been no change on that front. Indeed not, no. No, right. Well, let's do a song, shall we, Russell, let's without further song. ado? Indeed. And to help us in our endeavours, would you welcome onto the stage, please, the lovely Barb Younger and Michael Parker. Barb wearing one of a selection of outfits that she'll be modelling this evening. <laughs> a sort of potpourri of minimalist fashion in the 80s. And before. <laughs> um, <laughs> very touchy, these musos. Um, be careful. Michael Parker. Hello, Michael. You wouldn't think it to look at him, but uh, his father was a boxer. And his mother was a cocker spaniel. <laughs> um, after, I'd been, after I'd been to dinner with Lord Longford, I thought, I'll go to tea now. And um, I went to tea with Mike Smith. <laughs> we went by a car. <laughs> and... Uh, A round of applause for the car there. Mm. How kind. Um, and when we got there, he, he said, you must come and see my beautiful home. And it really has got a beautiful home. I can't tell you how beautiful it is. It really is a very beautiful home. Oh, sorry, I'm being heckled. <laughs> What's Sarah Green like? She was all right. Limped a bit, but I thought she was nice. <laughs> <laughs> Just a lilt, really. It wasn't a limp. It was <laughs> very nice. Dreadful sandwiches there, but we won't go on. <laughs> and I got home that evening and I, I thought, well, that really was a very beautiful home. In fact, I rang you up, didn't you I, did, Russell? Yeah. And what did I say? You said he's got a beautiful home. There we are. And it was beautiful, and it, it set me thinking about what my dream home would be like. And this is really a list of the things that you might find in my dream home. I thank you. I won a competition for a modern day home, and now I've got concealed lighting and a push button phone. I have a pump block lounge with an alcove in green and a thick pile carpet in rich tangerine. I have a coal effect clock and a lady shave room, a microwave telly and a non-stick vacuum, tinted double glazing which is 24 hours, and over my bath I've got a tease made shower. It's a dream of home. Of course, people don't seem to visit me very much anymore, but I can't complain. I still have my lovely dream home all about me. I think I've more or less forgotten the words to this final verse. But you catch my drift. It's basically just a long list of things that I have in my home. And uh, any moment now, there'll be a chorus, I believe, and I'll know exactly where I stand. I feel it coming upon me shortly. Any second now. Dream home. It's a dream home. Dream home. Of course, it's easy enough for 
never to remember their words. Only have to often dream of how I had a whole pile of words. I did have a bit of a mix up with my pills the other week and I had to be rushed to hospital and all that kind of thing, but the doctors just gave me some Valium and I feel a lot perkier now. Evening all. Police Constable Fan Club speaking to you. They said it could never be done, you know, that's what they told me at Hendon. That's where you're trained to be, policeman, Hendon. <laughs> Lord. What they said to me was they said, no way. Um, that's what policemen say, apparently. But things like no way or okie doke. Now, I picked all these up in Hendon. Um, that's the only thing you can pick up in Hendon. <laughs> um, right you are, that's another one. Um, but what, what they said to me was, they said, no way. They said, you'll never be a Bobby on the beat. But Kel Surprise, punters. <laughs> Kel Surprise, indeed. I've got some marigold gloves. And a truncheon in my pocket, I don't think I need to say more, do you? <laughs> and I'm rather enjoying it, this policeman lark. I'm, I've only been in the force a couple of weeks now, and already I'm president of the Shiny Helmet Club. <laughs> Can't be bad, can it? It's hard, though. I mean, it is a hard life being a policeman. It's not all flat feet and whistles. Um, not by a long chalk. The other morning, they rang me up, my superiors, and they said, we want to send you off to work. We want to send you off on a dawn raid. A dawn raid, if you please. I said, I'm sorry. <laughs> you won't see me before half past 10 in the morning. <laughs> well, you just won't. I, mean, I don't have my porridge till nine. And I'm not leaving the house without something hot inside me, not for anybody. <laughs> Sorry about that joke, I'm deeply ashamed of that line. They don't call us the filth for nothing, though. You know. It's fortunate for me, though, I've got a very understanding boss. This is a picture of him here. I'm James Anderton's personal assistant. And if you don't believe me, I've got the whip marks to prove it. <laughs> Certainly earned my stripes. And, um, we get on remarkably well together. In private, we even have pet names for each other. I call him Jimbo. He calls me the spawn of Beelzebub. <laughs> Works out quite well. It was him who sent me here this evening. He said, you're going to the Hackney Empire. He said, see if you can't improve relations a bit between the police and the young people because apparently some of you young people don't like us very much. Um, I don't know if this is right, and some of you don't trust the police. Well, we want to change all that. So from now on, any young person, or YP as we call them, <laughs> placed under arrest, won't automatically be beaten up in the back of the van. Good Lord, no. No way. <laughs> from now on, Upon your arrest, you'll be given a nice cup of herbal tea <laughs> and a fudge finger. <laughs> Apparently, it's just enough. <laughs> I 
Or if you get booked by the sergeant, you get a fish finger. <laughs> which is nice. All interrogations from now on will take place in the station sauna with the detective of your choice. And to cap it all, all high court judges will answer to the name of Shirley. <laughs> so what's new? <laughs> but how is this going to affect your average Bobby on your average beat? Well, take a look at me. And I'm in plain clothes. <laughs> if you catch my drift. I know David does. There's his clothes there. Plain is plain. But one difference any eagle-eyed felon or ne'er-do-well is going to notice immediately is the new range of police truncheons, which um, I believe you have there, Russell, thank you. Here we have it. It's pink and it's fluffy. Still capable of giving you a nasty brush on the cheek, though. Should it be considered necessary? Would you mind stroking my truncheon for me? to confirm its fluffiness. It is very fluffy, isn't it? Your hair's interesting, isn't it? It's quite fluffy as well. I'm, not going to, I'm only going to touch it. Lovely, you've got a center parting. I didn't think we had those in London anymore. What's your name? Will. Will. Have you met David? What do, what do you do? What do you do with yourself of a daytime, Will? I'm a gardener. Sorry? I'm a gardener. Oh, you're a gardener? Oh. Seedlings and all that kind of thing. Well, you are under surveillance, you understand. Loitering round a public comedian. Could be very nasty. Here you are, Russell. Catch this. Stick this where the sun don't shine, please. So, there we were, Jimbo and I, thrust together. In the professional sense, at least. And we had to come to terms with each other. I remember I said to him one day, I said, Jimbo, why don't you shave off that ridiculous beard? And he replied, they wouldn't like it in the coven. <laughs> we had a truce once, but Jimbo's olive branch turned out to be a birch stick. So there we have it. But there was one aspect of our lives together that drew us into a kind of cocoon of love. And that was the appreciation that we both felt for the music of the lovely Roger Whittaker. <laughs> you felt it too, I can tell. And the hours would pass like minutes as we'd sit in Jimbo's office, swaying gently backwards and forwards, backwards and forwards, to the strains of I'm going to leave old Durham town, or the last farewell. And it was really during one of these moments of oneness together that I found it in my heart to say a little prayer for the soul and spirit of James Anderton. And <laughs> that's not quite my approach. No. <laughs> no, I prefer to pray for somebody. And um, in fact, I was going to ask you if, if you wouldn't mind if you'd now join me um, in saying just a few words to whoever it is that lies out there in the great behind. <laughs> Answer my prayer. 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 Answer my prayer first. Answer my prayer. I don't know what you've got to pray Answer about, Russell. Prayer. Probably some girly. My Dear Lord, my look down on your servant Jimbo. My I know I do. My and ask him please to my stop sowing hatred in the minds of the ignorant. And if he won't stop sowing answer hatred in the minds of the ignorant, then strike him down, Lord. Strike him down. This is my prayer. Answer my prayer. I'm talking to you, Jimbo. Answer my prayer. You're the one for me, Jimbo. 
Do you like me like this? Come and get me, Jimbo. How kind, thank you. It is a lot more comfortable now. <laughs> Smart but casual. <laughs> My costume designer told me this was symbolic. He didn't tell me what of. <laughs> all right, Russell? Fine, thank you're you. bearing up? Oh, yes. Look at all this mess I've made here. Shocking. You being a Virgo would want to clear that up, I expect. Russell gets a lot of empathy from the audience. I, I can feel all the empathy going towards Russell now as we speak, sort of whoosh towards Russell. Can you feel it? Can, yes. Whoosh. Empathy being a bit like thrush in that respect, I think. <laughs> if there's any going, Russell gets it. <laughs> you got any moose on your hair this evening, Russell? No. no. Hard to tell. Sometimes he wears, yesterday he put some moose on, um, a great big mound the size of a hedgehog. <laughs> he put, it's been ages putting on and I can't tell the difference. <laughs> With or without. Um, I've been on the phone to Joe. <laughs> Don't look at me with those accusing eyes. Um, yes, I've been on the phone to Joan this evening and uh, she's very happy. She just popped into a private clinic, in fact, in Los Angeles to have leatherette intestines installed. <laughs> Apparently that's the latest thing now in Hollywood. Anyone who's anybody does have leatherette intestines. But they don't all have them with the Louis Vuitton motif throughout. <laughs> which is what Joan is plumped for, from gullet to exit. <laughs> but she asked me if I'd, if I'd mentioned to you one of her money-making ventures on the side. And I'm talking now about the Joan Collins School of Acting <laughs> for stage, screen, and airport terminal. Now, what I'd like to read you here, this is Vintage Dynasty script, and there are two parts. Normally, I read the part of Alexis Carrington myself, and because I do bear an uncanny and unnatural resemblance to her. <laughs> as I'm sure you'll agree, at the back. Can you hear me at the back? Yeah. They're receiving me at the rear, Russ. That's nice. That's good to know. <laughs> but the part, the part of Blake Carrington, I've got a feeling in my water this evening, that there's really only one person in this entire auditorium <laughs> who could do justice to such a plum roll. And it's you, David. Could I trouble you? <laughs> could we have some encouragement for David? You'll have to come with me. Just stand on my left, because I'm left-handed. Just working it out. Are you? Yeah, just working it out. All right. Yeah. You ready now? Yeah. What do you do with yourself? <laughs> Please. They're making up jokes by themselves. In what? what in, do you work? Yes. What, what do you do? Civil service. Oh. No, I don't think we applaud the civil service, do we? There must be a coach party in Russell. Somewhere south of the river, I expect. Um, no, no, I'm not talking about you, David. No, don't, don't get touchy. So what's your, um, what's your particular role within the civil service? Police. Oh, really? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> have you got a truncheon in your pocket this evening? Well, maybe. <laughs> a joke there, I think. <laughs> um, so have you done any acting before? Yes. Have you? What have you been in? The Nativity Play at school. <laughs> what part were you? Joseph. <laughs> Lovely. <laughs> now I can see it now, now you mention it. The resemblance is uncanny. And unnatural. <laughs> um, well, you're going to be Blake Carrington here, all right? So, um, 
so the head of the dynasty household is quite a meaty part for you. Um, I'm going to enter from over here, David. <laughs> You'll pardon the expression. And could, could I interrupt you? Could you be doing something? Could you be doing a bit of housework? A bit of hoovering? So you get, you get the um, maid to do it. Yes, but for that, just say, oh, Lord. <laughs> but on this particular day, the maid has gone off to a wedding because her sister's getting married. And he rang up the agency and said, can you send another maid? And they said, get lost. <laughs> so there you are, all right, doing the hoovering yourself. Could, could we see you? That's very thorough. Wouldn't want that thing pointed in my direction, would you? <laughs> Carry on, David, I'll be right back. <laughs> you can stop now. It's like you're giving the butler hand relief or something. <laughs> Um, good morning, Blake. I trust you slept well. Yes, thank you, like a log. I woke up in the fireplace. I saw you on the telly last night. Yes, yeah, so <laughs> I think you might be overacting slightly, David. <laughs> but it's very encouraging, good start. And you see, I've given you a, a, it's a, a weak joke, really. I'm, not a good joke at all, that's why I've given it to you. <laughs> but it's, I slept like a log, I woke up in the fireplace. So I want you, I want you to see if you can extract a bigger laugh on that line. <laughs> so we'll go from the to top again, back to your, back to your hoovering. Well, you can do either hand, can't you? <laughs> that's remarkable. Good morning, Blake. I trust you slept well. Yes, thank you. Like a log. I woke up in the fireplace. There we have it, David. That's your applause there. It's yours to take home with you. Thanks. I saw you on the telly last night. Yes, I'll sleep anywhere when I'm drunk. Has the milkman... Could you wait for my laugh to finish, please? Has the milkman come yet? Nobody's breathing heavily. <laughs> By God, Alexis, when I was a milkman, I left an empty behind. <laughs> I think you misread that line, would you? Oh, no, no, sorry. You missed out a vital word, didn't you? Have another crack at that line. By God, Alexis, when I was a milkman, I never left an empty behind. <laughs> Otherwise, we don't get the full extent of the double entendre, you see. <laughs> that word never is vital to that sentence. <laughs> was that your daughter I heard screaming? Yes, yeah, she makes a lot of noise, but her heart's in the right place. It's almost as if Blake Carrington was in this very room, isn't it? <laughs> Pity about the rest of her. I'm sorry to hear that Crystal gave birth to six piglets in the night. Yes, and I want to know the swine responsible. Sorry, that is a terrible line. Russell wrote that line. All part of life's rich Tupperware. <laughs> 